Hey, SCG Church, my name is Autumn, and we are so glad that you're here. If it's your first time at SCG, welcome. Please stop by the Welcome Center in the lobby to learn what we're all about and get to know some of our friendly staff and volunteers. We have a lot going on here at SCG Church that we want you to know about. In the next couple of weeks, we'll be starting up a bunch of classes to start the new year off right. On Mondays, starting this week, we're launching Run for God and Financial Peace University. So if you're interested in building an enduring faith through exercise and community, or would like to learn how to create better financial plans and habits, mark your calendars for Monday nights starting January 8th. We've got some good stuff on Tuesdays too. On January 9th, we are kicking off a new women's Bible class on the book of Acts. Join us for this seven week study where we will cover the book of Acts and the birth of the Christian church. Also on Tuesdays, we are launching a new session of Grief Share and Divorce Care. These two groups will help you walk through some of the most challenging seasons a person can go through. Grief Share will start with a Loss of Spouse seminar on January 16th, and Divorce Care will kick off on January 23rd. And the best thing about Tuesdays, we have child care for kids from birth through eighth grade if you sign up in advance. Next, if you are a seasoned believer, think over the age of 55, who is looking to dig deeper into scripture and build community with others in your same life stage, we have a ministry for you. It's called Heritage Bible Fellowship. This group meets every week on Sunday at 1045 in the CLC. They walk systematically through a book of the Bible with a trained Bible teacher, kind of like an old school Sunday school class. On February 4th, they are beginning a new study in the book of Luke. They would love to have you join them. If any of these opportunities sound interesting to you, visit our website at scgchurch.org slash events for more information or to register. We want to say thank you for generously supporting the work that God is doing here at SCG. You can give online or in person at the black offering boxes on your way out. And if you need prayer, head on over to the prayer and care corner in the lobby. We care about what God is doing in your life and we'll be ready to pray for you. Here at SCG, we believe that serving others is an important part of building our faith and character. So if you are interested in discovering ways that you can serve others here at SCG, we'd love to have you join one of our volunteer teams. Scan the QR code on the screen to help us get you plugged in to the right spot. There's always a lot going on here at SCG that you can be a part of. So stay up to date on the latest events by checking out all the tables on the courtyard, following us on our social media pages, and visiting us on our website at scgchurch.org. Hello, Seacoast Grace. Can we stand on up and try and warm up together? And can we set the tone for this year with a little bit of praise and worship? Let's do this together. Let's say, let every day.
to praise. Did you step into 2022 for like this? Can you say, oh, I've come to praise. Oh, I've come to praise. Come on, let's lift this next part up together. I praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise because you rose and defeated the grave. I praise because you're faithful. Praise because you're true. And praise because there's nobody greater than you. Oh, I praise because you're sovereign. Shines with hope and grace fills the sky with new mercies each day. We're alive. Let your glory pour out, Jesus. There's a joy that overwhelms our souls as we know our God is in control. Overflow. Let your favor.
This is the day that the Lord has made. And as we step into this new year, this new day, there's so much anticipation. There's so much excitement as we, we begin something new. And you know, I think we're able to have that. I know I'm able to have that because I can look back at 2023 and I can see all the ways that God was faithful to me, all the ways that God was present in my life, all the ways that he was standing right next to me and beside me. And so as we worship on this new song, I just wanna encourage you just to take a minute if you haven't already, and just think of a few ways maybe that God showed up for you last year so that you can walk into this next year with the hope, with the confidence that he's walking with you and that he's just so faithful. So let's worship together. When I was lost and all alone, your presence was where I found home. You were there. And you're here right now. In every high and every low, you never left me without hope. You were good and you're good right now. I'm witness your faithful.
to me, Jesus, I will tell them. Oh, I will tell them. You're so faithful, Jesus. You're so good to me, Jesus. Because I've witnessed your faithfulness. I've seen you breathe life within. So I'll pour out praise again you're worthy God you're worthy of all of it your promises never ever fail I've got stories I live to tell so I'll pour out my praise again you're worthy God you're worthy of all of And I just ask an invasive question. Could you raise your hand if you're an eyewitness of the goodness of God? Yes. Glory to God. We, we had a feeling that if we asked that question that there would be some hands that would go up. But there also may be a hand that may not have gone up yet. And one of the things that we wanted to do, whether it, you've never raised your hand in your life or maybe it's been a while since you've been able to raise your hand. We wanted to have a moment where we look back at what God has done and how faithful he's been. Uh, some people call it a throwback thing, but really what we're asking to do is if there's a moment now where you're unsure of what God is leading you to, one of the things we want to remind you, just look at the last place God met you. And that usually gives you an answer to where he's leading you. So if we could take a little bit of time to look back at God's faithfulness together as we worship through this one more song. Is that all right? When the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's a word That will bless your heart So I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required because oh, you search much deeper within and through the way things appear you're looking into my heart if you know this song can we lift it up together I'm coming back to the heart of worship Where it's all about you Yes, it's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made It's all about you It's all about you Lord, yes, oh, can we lift this up together, King of Endless, King of Endless Words, no one could express how much you deserve. much deeper you search much deeper within and through the way things appear you're looking into my heart so I'm coming back I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you yes it's all about
I'll bring you more than this song For the song in itself Is not what you have required You call us deeper, Lord, yes You search much deeper within And through the way things appear You're looking into my heart Can we just make this declaration for the year? I'm coming back to the heart of It's all about you Yes, it's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I Because it's all about you Yes, it's all about you Can we just tell him one more time? I'm coming back Coming back to the heart of the world, the heart of the matter, because it's all about you. Yes, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I because I realize it's all about you. Let it be. It's all about you, Jesus. Lord, the reason we can stand here in the beginning of a new year with praise on our lips and with adoration on our hearts is because you've been inside of our story. You've been working. Sometimes behind the scenes where we may have to look around and see the breadcrumbs and the clues to see that you are working in the midst. And sometimes it's so blatantly obvious. And if there is a praise in here that's an obvious praise of God bringing us through, praise be to God. But even still, if there's someone looking for a breadcrumb of your goodness or who you are or who you've been, May this be a time and place where we can push aside the distractions and the tribulations and the trials of last year. And we can focus in on something that is your faithfulness and your goodness. We gather into this place to encourage each other and to get a good look at your word for a fresh perspective of what you have for us. This is our prayer as we dive into your word today. We pray and ask these things in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Well, good morning. You guys make it through that ferocious wind out there? It's cold, wasn't it? I almost had to wear a jacket today. What is this? Anyway, glad that you're here. If you're uh, coming back, you visited us at Christmas or somebody brought you, we're, we're really excited that you're here joining us. We're actually starting a new series this weekend, and it kind of has like a 90s vibe to it. And so for some of you guys, you're like me, and you were raised in the 90s. Some of you guys, you raised kids in the 90s, and some of you... You read about the 90s as ancient history. So wherever you're at on that spectrum, I think I got some things maybe to help you remember some of the 90s. So I brought some, I didn't even have to buy really most of this. We had it at our house. Is, uh, maybe you've seen one of these before. You know what this is? Beanie Babies, right? And what was the collectible one that everybody wanted? Princess Diana. That's right, Princess Diana. Okay. Um, let's see. Maybe you snacked on these. Dunkaroos. No? Okay. I hate. Come on now. Uh, how about, did you have any of this? Yeah. Mm, okay, let me see what I got. Oh, 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 oh. Now, this one's controversial because there's two camps that you can be in. This is the camp I was in. I'm not sure what camp you were in, but. <laughs> now, what was the other camp? Backstreet Boys. Right, Backstreet Boys. I, I see we have some Backstreet Boys fans down there. Okay. Um, the other day we came across one of these at a wedding that we were at, and my kids had no idea what this was. They looked at it, and they're just like, what, how does that, they've never seen a camera, only on a phone, and so I had to show them, that's how it works. So, uh, got the disposable cams, oh, maybe you kind of got some jams on with one of these? All right, uh, ooh, this one's one of my favorites here. Does anybody know what this is? Pogs, that's right, Pogs. And do you remember what these metal ones were called? Slammers, yeah. Now, do you know what the double, triple size ones were? Grand Slammers. Sorry, I guess you weren't as deep into it as I was. Uh, this was my uh, earliest exposure to gambling with me and my friends, so we would bet for things there. Um, uh, this obviously is beginner's version. I had the more advanced version uh, growing up. Had my roller blades, maybe it had some grind plates here, things like that, if you remember. What was that one movie where it was all about rollerblading? 
Brink. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a great one. Zach Morris called. Hey, yo. I own this. This was mine. I, this is, okay. All right. All right. Um, okay. So I brought a couple of my favorite movies. Hook, obviously. Well, VHS. Yeah, Home Alone. You know this. Now, here's funny. We found this in our house. Oops. <laughs> ah. A little late to return that now, I think, so my bad. It's funny, as I was uh, preparing for this weekend, it's just funny. It's like 90s is everywhere now. 90s is back in, 90s fashion, things. 90s fashion is in. So my daughter is 11, and she looks identical to my wife at that same age. And so as she was opening up her presents this Christmas, it was funny because she was opening up the gifts that my wife at 11 would have opened up and had the identical gift. Like, she opened up, there's Doc Martens. <laughs> or like baggy pants. Or cargo pants, overalls. I mean, it's all back in style. I was reading an article, and the article said one of the things that's coming back in style are flannels. What? When did they go out of style? I thought they've always been in. So I guess I'm I'm fashionable. I don't know. One of the things that uh, I had when I was growing up, a fashion statement I made was one of these. Maybe you had one of these too, is a what would Jesus do bracelet. These things, especially if you were a church kid, they were everywhere. And I did some research to find out about the WWJD bracelets, and they didn't come out in the 1990s. They actually came out in the 1890s. Yeah, if you go back, there's a famous pastor, his name's Charles Spurgeon, and he gave a message based on actually a 1400s book called The Imitation of Christ. And he asked throughout that sermon, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Well, there was another pastor uh, named Charles who a couple of years later, Charles Sheldon, who wrote a popular book titled In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? And it ends up selling 30 million copies. And so this question is everywhere. Well, you fast forward about 100 years to 1989, and there's a youth pastor in the Midwest who reads this book and goes, you know, that's a really good question. And so she begins to make bracelets with WWJD, giving it out to the youth group, and it goes global. Now, I told that in the first service, and someone came up to me afterward and said, you know, my aunt is the one who created those bracelets. And so I texted her while you were telling the story, and goes, my pastor is talking about you right now. She says she never trademarked it. Biggest regret of her life. <laughs> but even if you're not into these bracelets, this isn't really your fashion, and they're a little bit corny, which they probably are. I still think it's a really good question. And it was not just a good question back then. Even in the 1800s, I think it was a good question in the first century. I think it's a part of what it means to be a Christ follower, is to ask that question. So I want to look at a story that asks this question. Now, the story takes place in the book of Matthew. If, you don't have your, uh, if you're not a Bible person, you're not really sure what it is, is you have the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the stories of Jesus. And they're written by either people who knew Jesus or who interviewed people who knew Jesus. And the one that we're going to look at today is by a guy named Matthew, one of Jesus' disciples. And he's actually going to talk about, here is how I met Jesus. And so if you get to your Bibles, we'll be in Matthew 9. Here's what it says. Matthew 9, 9. As Jesus went on from there, so the previous scene, Jesus had just healed somebody, a paralytic. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. And so this is at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. And he's beginning to teach and he's beginning to perform miracles. And he started to call some guys, um, the first few were Andrew and Peter, to start hanging out with him, to get to see who he is. And so they're with him and they see this guy named Matthew, who's a tax collector. If you don't know anything about tax collectors, they're pretty much they're the lowest of the low within that culture. Nobody liked them. They were outcasts because they were people, they were Jewish people who worked for the enemy of Rome, and then they would go and tax their people, oftentimes tax them extra, and then they would keep it. And so nobody liked them. And so Jesus comes into contact with this guy, and he can say anything, but what does he say? He says this, he says, follow me. So he looks at this tax collector and he says, I want you to follow me. Now, remember, Peter just started following Jesus. He just got this invitation. He dropped everything in order to come and to follow him. And then what does Jesus do in return? He goes to this tax collector and goes, come and hang out with me. No, no, so now this guy's a part of our crew? 
let me see if I can make sense of this, is let's imagine you and I were hanging out and I said, hey, I'm going to invite one of my friends along. And my friend shows up and he has a giant swastika tattoo right here. You're going to go, okay, that's hmm, unexpected. I'm not sure that this is going to be great for my reputation. And yet this is who Jesus calls. If you don't know anything about what this call is, this call to follow him, what he's calling him to is not just into a relationship with him, but to be what's called a disciple. And we see this over and over again in the scriptures. And there's a lot behind this word. It starts at actually a young age with Jewish students, about five or six years old, they would begin to memorize the Old Testament. And as they got on in their ages, eventually when they're about 12 or 13, they would finish their education. They either go into the family business or find a trade. Or if they were a girl, they would begin to find someone to marry. But there would be this select group, the best students that would be able to continue on their education until they memorized the entire Old Testament word for word. And at the very top of that group, there would be people who would go to find a rabbi and potentially become their disciple. And so what the interview process looked like is, remember, this is the elite, this is the top of the top, is the rabbi would begin to pepper them with questions. What is this verse? What does it mean? What does the scholar think about this? And if they thought that they were a worthy student, not only were they knowledgeable, but they had the drive to become a rabbi, they would give them an invitation, follow me. And that invitation was to become just like the rabbi. That's what it means to be a disciple, is, that it is a person who becomes a carbon copy, who becomes in every facet just like the one in which they're following. There was this old saying that they had, which is, be covered in the dust of your rabbi, meaning you walk so closely in their footsteps that you're covered in their dust. And so that's what it would look like, is day in and day out, 24-7, you would try to understand how they think, how they live, what they feel, even how they looked, how they ate, everything you wanted to be just like them. Because at the end of it, you were going to become a replica of your rabbi. You're going to go out into the world, and if you encounter situations in which you're supposed to make a decision, your question is going to be, well, how would my rabbi decide this? Or if you find yourself in conflict, how would my rabbi deal with this? I have, to make a, um, uh, I have to manage a relationship. How would my rabbi do this? And so people who are followers of Jesus, called disciples in the scriptures, we naturally would ask this question. What would Jesus do? What would my rabbi do? And so I think it's a good question, is what would Jesus do? Because that seems to be at the core of what it means to follow Jesus. Well, this is a huge honor for Matthew to be called into this uh, discipleship under this rabbi. And so here's how he responds. He got up and he followed. I mean, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. He goes from being an outcast to now a disciple. And the people who are watching this were probably stunned because you just heard what it took to become a disciple of a rabbi. I mean, it is a huge honor. It's a long process. And then all of a sudden, this guy who is an outcast in one moment's time becomes a disciple. He didn't even have to earn it. He didn't have to prove it. All he had to simply do was say yes. And we already see before they even knew how this was going to play out that Jesus was different. He's different than all the other rabbis. He's different than all the other religions in the world. Because they're all based on if you're worthy, if you prove yourself, if you do enough, then God will forgive you. Then God will love you. Then you'll have eternal life. And Jesus comes along and he goes, no, that's not how this works at all. You're never going to be worthy. And so I'm going to make you worthy. And it's through my invitation, and it's eventually going to be through my death on the cross, that you are going to be able to follow me. It's not based on what you do, it's based on what I've done for you. And so there's two really important theological concepts that we see here, and I just want to briefly touch upon those. There's two words. These are your theology words for the day. The first one is justification. Justification is the idea that because Jesus died on the cross for your sins, all you have to do is say yes, accept it, and give your life to him. Now you are justified, meaning God looks at you, and instead of seeing all of your sin he sees forgiveness. He says, you're not guilty. We're in right standing. You're justified. And that happens the moment you say yes to Jesus. Everything is wiped away. But there's this other thing called sanctification. And sanctification is the process that you spend for the rest of your life becoming more like Jesus. 
consistently asking, well, what would Jesus do? Then that's what I'm going to do. And this is a never-ending process because you won't be Jesus in this life. But this is something that happens for, this is a really important distinction. I think people get this wrong sometimes. It's because Jesus has saved us, we ask, what would Jesus do? We don't ask what Jesus would do because it saves us. And it's very important because it's what makes Christianity different than any other faith in the world. Verse 10. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Peter's having a tough day. Because Peter not only is now having to hang out with Matthew, but Jesus decides we're going to go to Matthew's house. And guess who's at Matthew's house? Many tax collectors and sinners. And sinners is just, these people are living a wild life. Everybody knows it. These are the worst of the worst. And now he has to go and he has to hang out with them. And you have to imagine he's thinking, Jesus, do you not care about your reputation? You're supposed to be a rabbi, a religious leader. And yet Jesus doesn't really care. There's something about Jesus in which he could care less about his reputation. He goes, look, I know who I am. I I know what I've come to do. And so I'm not really worried about it, which is really good news for people like you and I, because it means that Jesus would hang out with us. He would come to our house for dinner. It doesn't matter what you've done. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter what's in your past or even what you're currently into. Jesus would like you. And I think you would like Jesus. There is something about Jesus that people who are nothing like him, like him. Verse 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So they're looking at this other rabbi, this religious leader, and going, um, we would never do that. Because we don't want to be contaminated by these people's sin. These are bad people. We're not going to hang out with bad people. And usually the Pharisees are the bad people in the, the story when they're op- in the opposition to Jesus. But I kind of get their point here. Is, is not a good look. Like, let's imagine you saw me later today, and you're driving by a crack house, and I'm entering into it to have dinner. <laughs> Your immediate reaction is like, I don't know about that. That's weird. Even if that's not your reaction, let's imagine it's not me, it's one of your kids. You're going to go, uh, uh uh-uh. You're not going there. Because, and I think rightfully so, as parents, one of our jobs is to direct the people that our kids hang out with. And so if I see a kid who has bad manners, uses cuss words, and his parents are a little questionable, I'm going to steer my kids away from them to somebody else. And so we actually come to this point in which I think what would Jesus do is a great question, but it has its limitations. In fact, I would even make this claim. What Jesus would do is not always what you should do. Let me see if I can unpack this a little bit before you yell heretic. (laughs) Jesus can do things you can't do. Like, let's say you're hanging out with your friends and they're hungry. Guess what you can't do? Multiply bread. You can eat bread multiple times, which I am guilty of, but I cannot multiply bread. You know what else? If you're stranded on a boat, guess what Jesus could do? Walk on water. You cannot. You also cannot perform miracles. You can't forgive people of their sins. Jesus can do a lot of things you can't do. In fact, there may be things that you can do, but you shouldn't do that Jesus would do. If you're an alcoholic, it's probably not a good idea for you to be hanging out in a bar. But Jesus probably would be all right with it. He could do it. Then there's also things that I can do that Jesus decided not to do, like have a wife and kids. And so sometimes there are these areas where it's not quite as easy as we would like to make it. When we ask the question, what would Jesus do? And in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about all those nuances and how to figure those things out. But I want to focus in on just just one problem with the question, what would Jesus do? And it is, the question assumes that you and I know what Jesus would do. I don't think we do. A lot of people claim to know what Jesus would do, and it's always very interesting because they are all, Jesus always does the things that they're already doing. Like they could be on both sides of an issue, and both sides are claiming Jesus would stand with me. So I did a Google search of all the articles, the news articles, that had what would Jesus do in the title. Here's a few of them. What would Jesus do at, church, what, at a church gun raffle? The author argued, when he said, my peace I give to you, that's not the peace he was talking about. <laughs> this one was in the LA Times. What would Jesus do? He'd get the COVID, uh, COVID vaccine. 
This one, uh, what would Jesus do during pride? Simple, he'd wave the rainbow flag and march in the parade. What would Jesus do? Not what the MAGA right is doing. This, one's a, this next one's a New York, uh, specific to New York. What would Jesus do? He'd build a bike lane on McGinnis. Apparently there's some bicyclists and there Jesus would be biking with them. What would Jesus do? He would give the homeless cash. That's in Forbes. And then this one I thought was kind of funny is, uh, what would Jesus do? Pack heat, Michigan priest says. I think we can have people on both sides of an issue claiming Jesus would be there because Jesus, what Jesus would do is often counterintuitive to what you and I would do. Like, think about this. Jesus would have these large crowds begin to gather listening to what he was saying. And more and more people would come. And if it were me or if it were you, one of the things that I would do in that moment is, okay, I'm going to do a miracle because this is just going to put it over the top. People are going to be amped. They're going to be all about me. And you know what Jesus does? He stands up there and he goes, okay, now the next thing is you need to drink my blood and eat my flesh. And everybody leaves. <laughs> Jesus, what are you doing? It's so counterintuitive that even those who knew him best, like Peter, he said something where Peter was so shocked that he rebuked Jesus and said, no, that's not how it's going to go. And then Jesus says right back to him, get behind me, Satan. There's this saying, and most of us have probably heard it before, is I know just enough to be dangerous. And I think there's different ways to understand this saying. And one of them is, I know just enough to be dangerous to myself. And that's kind of what's happening with Peter in that moment, is he knows just enough about Jesus to know he is somebody, maybe even the Messiah, but he doesn't know enough to know he should just be quiet and watch. And I think this is true of a lot of people, Christians and non-Christians. Everybody claims what Jesus would do, and I think it's because they know just enough to get themselves in trouble, but not enough to know how much they don't know. So one of the famous, most famous quotes of Jesus, that people quote of Jesus, is, do not judge or you too will be judged. You hear this all the time. It's usually when you're calling somebody out because they're doing something they shouldn't do, and they go back, respond with, well, you know, Jesus says not to judge, so stop judging me. I love that. You've never read the Bible before. You even have read that verse, because if you continue on with that verse, you know what he says next? He says next, because you have a plank in your eye, and you're trying to get the speck out of your brother's eye. So what you should do is remove the plank out of your own eye so that you can help get the speck out of his. What is he saying? He is saying, you're a hypocrite. So stop judging other people when you're not even living up to it. What you should do is get your life on track. Then you can help other people as well. And then after this, he says, do not throw pearl before swine. What is he talking about? He says, judge who is ready to hear the gospel and who is not. Who is ready to hear about Jesus and who isn't. What's at the core of asking what would Jesus do? Asking how would Jesus judge? How would Jesus judge the circumstance, this person, how we should... But see, we, we know just enough to get ourselves in trouble, but not quite enough to know that we don't know. There's these, in the 90s, these PSAs that you might have seen on TV... And they would be something like promoting education or they're anti-drugs or whatever. And they were by a celebrity. And at the end of it, there would be this little screen that says, the more you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's the solution. One of the ways that you can best answer this question of what Jesus would do is, well, you got to know more. <laughs> you got to know him more. Recently, my wife and I were out to dinner with some friends. And having a great time, great conversation. And then I just saw the, the conversation begin to turn. Somebody kind of made this claim. And it started to get a little contentious. And I just sat back because I was really uninterested and I'm listening. But I knew that my wife was not going to let it slide. And so I'm watching her as this person is making the claim. I'm watching her and I'm going, oh, there's going to be fireworks right now. This is going to be awesome. I can't wait to see what happens. And she didn't have to say a word to me. She didn't have to. I knew exactly what she was thinking and feeling in that moment. And so when it comes to the question is, what would Amy do? I have a pretty good answer. I know what Amy would do. I try to avoid what Amy would do on a regular basis. And the reason I know what Amy would do is because I've spent so much time with her. We've been together for years now. And I know her. I know how she's reacted in the past. I know how she thinks. I know how she feels about certain things. And so I think that that's what it's supposed to look like as we follow Jesus. 
is as we walk through life, we don't even, we don't even have to ask because we just know. We just know Jesus so well that when we encounter situations, we just go, oh, I know what Jesus would do right here. I know how he would react in this circumstance. And so that's what I'm going to do. So here's a good place to start. To know what Jesus would do, start with what he did. To know what Jesus would do, start with what he did. That means looking into the scriptures, understanding them, memorizing them. Digging deep and understanding what, what the interpretations and the, the meanings of these things were. Because here's what you're going to discover. The more you know Jesus, the more you're going to realize how much he has laid out for us. How clear he has made things. He didn't leave us guessing. He, he oftentimes gave us direct commands and said, hey, this is what's best, so go and do this. Or he, he gave us some guiding principles or some lines for us to, to stay in. He says, okay, look, you can go somewhere between here and here. And even when it's not super clear, he gives us principles and values. Like in today's story. Today's story, he gives us some principles and values to live by. So in verse 12, we see how he reacts. Here's what he does. On hearing this, so this, remember, is the Pharisees calling him out. Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Now that's not, if you're not familiar with Jesus, or you are reading this for the first time, that is not how I would think Jesus would respond in this situation. Again, he does things that are counterintuitive. Because my thought was, when these people are getting called out, Jesus would probably step up and defend them and go, hey, guys, these are good people. If you get to know them, their hearts are in the right place. They've just made some mistakes. Or he might even defend them and say, hey, you know what? You shouldn't judge people because they're going to you know, judge you back. And that's a... He doesn't say any of that. Jesus' response is, I know they're depraved. They're degenerates. These people are a complete disaster. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> You've got to imagine Matthew sitting there going, Jesus, I can hear you. Me and my friends, we are, you know, you're, you're kind of being insulting right now. And Jesus probably looked at me, Matthew, do I really need to lay this out for you? You're a loser, and all of your friends are losers. You're a disaster. It's why you all hang out. It's the common denominator between all of you. Losers. I know, it's counterintuitive, isn't it? And yet, that's what he does. Because in John's gospel, in the first chapter, John says that Jesus was full of truth and grace. He was full of truth and grace. Every situation that Jesus was in, he would be full of truth, just like this. Matthew, let's be honest. Here's who you are, dude. And it doesn't matter who they are. It was the same with religious leaders. Religi they would come along, and they got everything together. They understand the scriptures. They're living according to all the rules. And Jesus goes, you're so fundamentally broken, you need to be born again. There is no help for you. And then he would turn around and then he would show them grace. Matthew, I'm not here because you earned it or you deserve it. Remember I called you when you were a tax collector sitting there taking people's money? What did you do to deserve to hang out with me? To have the honor for me to be in your house today? I actually sacrificed my reputation to be here right now with you. And eventually it's going to cost me my life. Did you deserve any of that? Oh, no, 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 because it's my grace. And so he had these things, this, this tension that he was able to live in because he was full of truth and grace. And so when I think about this, I think, okay, next time that I'm in a contentious discussion with somebody whom I love, which will probably be within the next 24 hours, one of the things I'm going to have to remember is I need to be full of truth and grace. In that moment, I just have to stop. And go, okay, what would Jesus do? He would be full of truth and grace. And this is something that's so hard to get right because all of us naturally fall to one side or the other. Some of us are truth people. I'm a truth person. I know what is right and what is wrong, and I will tell you all the things you're doing wrong. I will give you a list later on. Like, here's where you're messing up. But when it comes to the grace part, uh, I kind of struggle with that a little bit. Some of you guys are grace people. Oh, man, let's just hug it out, you guys. I know you're going to prison soon, but it's fine. We're good. I mean, it'll be great, right? We're, we're grace people. And Jesus says, now nah, you got to be both. You got to be full of truth and grace. And one of the areas I think is most obvious, maybe this is the life stage that I'm in, is when it comes to parenting. Man, it's hard to be full of truth and grace in parenting. 
Because my kids, man, there's days when I just, truth, I want to tell them truth. And, I, and I've seen lots of parents like this, where we're just holding them accountable. You, you, here's what you need to do. Here's where you're messing up. And here's where you need to go. And then there's other parents who are on the gray side in which they go, eh, it's fine. I'm not going to hold them accountable. I'm not going to hold them to a standard. Just kind of make sure that we're buds. I had to wrestle with this recently when one of my kids came home, and this was the first time this has happened. They came home and they failed a test. They gave me the test, and thankfully I was studying this passage, and I said, okay, truth and grace, truth and grace. Because the truth part of me wants to go, you didn't study, you know you can do better than this. There's a reason why you haven't failed before you failed this time. It's because you were not studying, and I, did, I could go in. You know, you're going to work in fast food for the rest of your life, which actually is not bad. It's $20 an hour. Dad's thinking about taking an after job, but you know what I'm saying. Go in on him. I'm like, okay, but there's the grace part. So what does this look like? And so I'm wrestling, okay, hey, let's be honest, you could have done better. It was lack of studying, it was lack of preparation, there's something you didn't understand, we could have worked through that, and so let's own that part. And then, you know I love you whether you succeed or not. We're always going to be good. And it's that balance, and I don't know if I got it right, but, but here's what is the value of answering what would Jesus do, is it makes me wrestle with it. Instead of just lean on what my natural tendency might be. So here's how the story ends. Verse 13. But go and learn. This is just, Jesus is throwing shade at the Pharisees right now. Because that's all they do. All they do is go and learn all day. They study the scriptures. They memorize. They discuss them. But he says, go and learn what this means. And then he quotes an Old Testament passage. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. <laughs> and they're going, yeah, we know that one, Jesus. We memorized that one when we were like 12. But what was he saying? He wasn't saying, no, no, you need to go and learn. You need to actually practice what you've learned. Because it's a really good question to ask, what would Jesus do? But it's only a good question if you put it into practice. If you answer what Jesus would do, and then you actually... I try to boil this down, because following Jesus is actually, at least on paper, really, really easy. It's very simple. I put it in a couple words. Here's what it looks like to follow Jesus. Ask and apply. That's it. That's what it all boils down to. I know, I went to seminary. All for that right there is ask and apply. Ask, what would Jesus do? And then apply it to my life. No matter what he asks me to do. I remember this, um, this quote from Charles Stanley. He was a pastor, old school pastor, recently passed away. Here's what he says. He says, if he tells you to run your head through a brick wall, start for the wall. As you go to put your head through, God will make a hole for it. And so I want to modify my ask and apply and maybe add this, add this on this. Ask and apply even if you don't know why. Ask and apply even if you don't know why. That's what it means to follow Jesus. That's what it looks like. It all boils down to this right here. It's simply ask and apply. When I was a youth pastor, um, it's been quite a while now, I used to ask our students this. I said, let's just do an experiment where we imagine what the world would look like if everybody asked this question. What would Jesus do? And then they applied it to their life. What would the world look like? We say around here, Jesus changes everything. Literally, the world would be completely different because, and we'd come up with a list. I mean, no more abuse or violence or divorce or discrimination, racism, addiction, greed. I mean, you think about how drastically people would live. I said, well, here's the bad news. They're not going to do it. The world is not going to, it's not going to happen in the world. But here's the good news. You still can. And so let's imagine what your life would look like if you simply asked and then applied you probably have a lot less shame and guilt, experience a lot more fulfillment and purpose, wisdom and hope. You'd flourish in your relationships, and you would definitely have a deeper connection to God. And so here's the really good news, is that starting today, you can do that. You just have to say yes. Just like a Matthew was called to follow, you too can follow. And you can just simply do this. Ask and apply even if you don't know why. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for not leaving us in the dark, but allowing us to know you first and foremost, to be in a relationship with you, provided by your sacrifice on the cross. And Lord, we know that there's nothing that we can do to earn that. 
It's just simply a gift that we receive. And yet, in return, we want to be people who follow you, who know you more and become like you. And so, Lord, it's such a simple question. So simple, we can just put it on a bracelet. And yet, it is so hard to do because we are constantly fighting for control. And so, Lord God, help us to be able to not only answer the question of what you would do as we navigate this next week, but help us to have the strength to apply it. Lord, we thank you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, we guys stand with me. Thank you for being here, especially if you're a guest. We're just so honored that you would hang out with us. We'll invite you back next week. Other than that, we'll see you then. God bless.